I don't know about y'all, but if this is the good news, I sure don't want to hear the bad news. <laughs> this sounds to me like a good old Jonathan Edwards fire and brimstone sermon, doesn't it? You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? I have to laugh that when this text was chosen for the third, third Sunday in Advent, we still used the pink candle and called this Joy Sunday, <laughs> right? So rejoice, you brood of vipers. The axe is lying at the root of the tree just for you. <laughs> John's words today are harsh and threatening, right? They're intended to be harsh and threatening. And so I wonder, do they make you uncomfortable? Maybe you're wishing that instead of John's sermon today, we could have read his father Zechariah's song for Joy Sunday, right? And you, child, should be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare the way, to bring God's people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. That seems a lot more joyful. I think it's safe to say that what we get today is another one of those dark Advent texts dark in the sense that it's hard to see where God is in it, right? All the stuff that John says is good and important and true, so we know that God's in there somewhere. It's just kind of hard to tell where, right? I've been talking this season about the importance of sitting in the dark, allowing that discomfort to work on us. So I wonder if you'll join me for a moment in sitting in the darkness, in sitting in the shadow of death. Sitting here in the dark, maybe you're wondering how John's sermon fits with Paul's light and cheery encouragement to rejoice in the Lord always, and Zephaniah's hopeful encouragement to uh, rejoice and exult with all your heart. As a matter of fact, I think that John and Zephaniah actually would get along pretty well, because we read from the last half of the last chapter of Zephaniah's book today, and it's all light and cheery. But the two and a half chapters before that are uh, right up John's alley. The whole book starts off with, um, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, says the Lord. I will sweep away animals and humans. I will sweep away the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. I will cut off humanity from the face of the earth, says the Lord. And then it just goes downhill from there, if you can believe it. <laughs> and yet... Zephaniah ends with this hopeful song that we read today. How does that work? How do you get from their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung to he will exult over you as at the, as a, with loud singing as on the day of a festival? I don't know about you, but I have a hunch that maybe what's inconsistent about this message isn't the message itself but those of us who are discomforted by hearing it. Our default when we read these passages of Scripture that challenge us is to turn away from them, right? We would rather uh, look toward the coming dawn than sit in the darkness. We try to explain them away or rationalize them. We say like, well, that's not written for me, or, you know, it, it's, it's symbolic. It means something else. And we can't do that, we just ignore them, like we ignore the first two and a half chapters of Zephaniah. We can't face the darkness, so we turn ourselves to the light. But Advent doesn't let us get away with that. Oh no, sir. Advent confronts us with these dark texts where God is hidden, and it won't let us turn away. So since we're sitting in the darkness anyway, let's explore it a little, shall we? If this text makes you uncomfortable, Ask yourself, why is that? What is it about this text that makes you squirm? Maybe you don't necessarily feel convicted by John's sermon, but maybe it just doesn't really fit with your idea of who God is. I mean, isn't God loving and forgiving, right? Axes and winnowing forks don't necessarily sound like the tender compassion of our God. John's focus on behavior is not exactly good Lutheran theology, right? Aren't we saved by grace rather than works? Those are a few things that make me uncomfortable in this text. 
And as I read this text, I have to admit to feeling threatened, right? I don't overcollect taxes and I don't extort people with false accusations, but I do have two coats and plenty of food. Actually, I have more than two coats, but I don't tell anyone. <laughs> this text forces me to wonder if that ax is lying there for me. Does it do the same for you? And I think that's exactly what John and Luke want us to think about. John says right out, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. In other words, don't think you're safe just because you believe the right things or are part of the right people, right? John wants us to be unsettled. He wants us to be afraid. So why is that? Last week, I pointed out how hope can sometimes be used as a tool of privilege. And I asked if perhaps the shadow of hope or the death of hope can actually sometimes transform us in a way that we become more open to what God is doing. Now, privilege, you see, isn't an inherently bad thing. Having privilege doesn't make a person bad or wrong. Where privilege gets us into trouble is when we uncritically defend our privilege at the expense of others. And that sounds to me a little bit like what the tax collectors and the soldiers are doing in this, in this story, right? And so I wonder if that's maybe what John is trying to do here, is to make me aware of my privilege by knocking it out of my hands for a moment. Because when I stoop to pick it up, I have to look at it. You might even say that John is shining a light on my privilege, ironically. In his case, privilege is being a descendant of Abraham. But what's your privilege? What's your equivalent of having Abraham as your ancestor? Is it racial privilege? Is it the privilege that comes with uh, social status or economic security? Does it come from having full use of your senses and your limbs? Is it the privilege that comes from identifying as a Christian or as a Lutheran? Privilege doesn't have to be universally recognized to be powerful. It just has to be something that we think puts us above someone else. I wonder, in reading this text, if John isn't trying to rattle our cages a little bit to make us see the bars. Privilege can insulate us from the suffering of others, but it also means being insulated from the ones who suffer. In her book, Austin Channing Brown recounts multiple stories of white friends and co-workers who, despite their genuine love and good intentions, constantly and consistently remind her that she is not one of them. Whether it's touching her hair, or making assumptions uh, about her because of her race, or telling her to have grace and patience for the ignorant racist rants that she hears all the time, the message is the same. It's completely unintentional, of course, but that's the problem, right? Because how can these well-meaning white folks be aware of what they're doing when their privilege keeps them locked away from her pain? The same is true in John's case. Tax collectors use their privilege to benefit from their jobs. Soldiers use their privilege to extort money. Even average people like you and me use our privilege to keep ourselves warm and fed and safe while others are not. Privilege protects us, but it can also imprison us. And that makes Paul's choice of words in his letter very interesting to me. He writes, The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. And that word guard, think about that English word guard. The Greek word that it translates does the same thing. It can mean either to keep safe and to protect or to hold prisoner, right? A guard can be a jailer, or a bodyguard. And so I read this text and I wonder if it doesn't mean both. What would happen if we let go of that privilege that's currently guarding our hearts and minds? 
Maybe we would no longer be able to so easily rest in the comfort of believing that God will make everything right in the end somehow, in spite of us. But maybe we might also find a living, breathing, bleeding hope as the peace of God takes us captive and brings us along on a new way of being, a way in which there is no privilege that keeps us separate from one another, but in which God abides in us and we abide in one another. Maybe that could be a place where God is in this dark text. That's where I see them anyway. After sitting in the dark with Paul and John and Luke and Zephaniah, I think I hear God inviting me to give up my privilege before God takes it away. Maybe that's what you hear, or maybe you hear something different. That's what's tricky about sitting in the dark, is it's hard to know exactly where God is. What we do know, however, is that God is in the dark with us, and that that is a cause for joy, even on Brood of Vipers Sunday. I wonder if maybe that is the good news that allows us to rejoice in the Lord always, even when there seems to be very little to rejoice about. Even the darkness can be cause for a song. Even a warning can be an occasion for a shout of joy, because even in the threat of judgment, there is the promise of justice. What I hear in this text today is nothing short of the unconditional love of God. It's the dark side of that love, to be sure, but it's love all the same. Think about it. If God loves the people being extorted by the soldiers as much as God loves the soldiers, if God loves the people being swindled by the tax collectors as much as the tax collectors, if God loves those who go cold and hungry as much as those of us who do not, Don't you think that might make God a little upset? Don't you think that might make God kind of angry? Don't you think maybe God wants to change that a little bit? To me, it makes perfect sense that God would be angry and that we would hear that anger coming from that love as God is upset by the things that we do to one another or even to ourselves. Maybe you hear the threat of punishment in this text, but I don't, right? Punishment, you see, is a human thing. It's a human idea. God's sense of justice is restorative, not retributive. Remember how John, excuse me, how Luke introduced John last week, quoting from Isaiah, the valleys will be filled in and the hills and mountains be made low. That's what I hear John proclaiming here. The lofty are brought down, and the lowly are filled up. I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds like a recipe for peace. Even if it is peace that's a little bit beyond my understanding. And so, as much as this text discomforts me, makes me squirm a little bit, I'm okay sitting in the dark with it. I'm okay just letting it work on me for a little bit. See what else I can learn. And for that, I rejoice.